Hey guys, welcome back to Total Tactics Football. It's Fran here and we'll be looking at a Game Week 8 cheat sheet preview. And of course, this is a big kind of turn of fixtures because this is a, a key moment where a lot of people are wild carding. On top of that, I think we have the international break. So there's going to be a lot of potential for players to kind of miss out on Game Week 8 and, and maybe kind of be excluded from your kind of selections. Um, you'll have to kind of stay update, up to date with the latest news in terms of whether or not players are available. A good example is, for example, uh, the Brazilian players who are set to play a game on the 15th of October and then have around 36 hours before Game Week uh, 8 actually starts to play the game. Rafinha is, is an example of a player who has to play Southampton on the 16th of October and only has 36 hours to you know, take a flight back to England and actually try to make the cut. Uh, so it's very likely, for example, that he is a player who could miss out, um, especially if he plays the game on the 15th. Um, another good example is Firmino, who actually isn't being selected for national duty. So that kind of hurts someone like Jota, for example, who I'll describe and also discuss a little bit later. Hey guys, just before the video starts, I'd love to shout out OneFootball for this video. The link is in the description below. Whether you're an Android or an iPhone user, you can use it as basically the ultimate football fan app. You can find live updates of games, how things are going in terms of yellow cards, red cards, suspensions, or even kind of goals and assists. You can also use it as a tracker to kind of anticipate how games are going to go, how well players are expected to perform. You can also use it to kind of make sure you track all the news in football that are relevant to you, whether you're just looking at the Premier League, Champions League, or even international fixtures to kind of look at how that actually impacts your FPL week for Game Week 8. You can use this app for absolutely everything to get a gauge of, for example, how managers feel um, players are going to play. So, for example, something like Rafinha and his availability in Game Week 8 will definitely be something you can look for on the app. You'll also be able to look at plenty of other kind of statistics as well on the app and be able to kind of tailor your needs and preferences to what you exactly you want um, as a football fan. So please check it out in the description below. All right, guys. So actually, let's have a look at the cheat sheet. Um, if we actually start with the kind of defenders, I think there's actually been quite a significant amount of movement here. Uh, and, and a lot of it has to do with the fact that there's a slight change in the guard in terms of who are the most interesting teams, I think, defensively. I think Arsenal has been steadily on the rise. And yes, whilst this is probably um, the last kind of end of, of their great fixtures, I think you, we can clearly say that, you know, the ability to access Arsenal defenders at a very cheap price is still super worthwhile. So someone like Ben White or someone like Tomiyasu still holds a great value in your team as that kind of fourth defender. In most weeks, he could easily be, you know, these players could easily be your third defender, as we saw in the, in the week previous, where they just got that clean sheet, which could have been, you know, the difference between having a good game week and, and, and an average or a very poor game week, right? And, you know, Ben White and Tomiyasu have been fantastic options. I think Tomiyasu is a little bit overrated in terms of whether or not he's going to provide attacking uh, returns for the team. And Ben White is interesting because obviously in games where Arsenal are under threat a lot, for example, in the Brighton game, you can see that he clearly has the potential to get a good amount of bonus points. And that's kind of like the little trade off there between the two players. I actually think Ben White probably makes the most sense just because he is a little bit cheaper on the budget side and you have access to someone who, um, you know, clearly has basically Arteta's favor in terms of being able to start consistent games as long as he's fit. Um, in terms of movements lower down, I think there's only just been a slight change in terms of that 4.9 to 5.1 category where we can clearly see that the new entrant is going to be Cucurella. And I think what's nice about Cucurella is that he's clearly playing this kind of left wing back position and he's basically spamming crosses for this team. And we know that that's basically a player who's a bonus magnet, right? Someone who can actually provide quick effective crosses uh, that are not intercepted. And he, that's exactly what he's providing for this Brighton team at this moment in time. And that's exactly why he's gotten bonus points so far. At the price range, I think, of course, 4.9 to 5.1 is a weird category, right? Where you don't have access to the premium players from, let's say, Man City and Chelsea or even Liverpool. But there is a potential for to have maybe one differential in this kind of range. And if you're someone who's been holding Christensen or something like that, this could be a straight swap that you'd like to go for if you're not a big fan of, let's say, cash and target from Aston Villa. Uh, in terms of Sufal, I think I have to say that he has to simply drop. It just comes down to the fact that he's, he's likely to be injured. So actually... Uh, there's a little bit of a worry there, right, uh, in terms of whether or not he's actually available to play in the first place. And then on top of that, I think it's just the fact that West Ham's defense has been very, very poor. Uh, we've seen them get overwhelmed and also kind of hit on the counter several times. I think the lack of depth also kind of hurts their midfield and whether or not they're able to be, they'll be kind of able to play with full fitness at times. And we've seen, for example, Socek... Uh, have a poor game here and there and that really ultimately affects you know Sufal's ability to haul and be a consistent point hauler 
I think what we saw at, um, in Sufa at the start of the season was someone who could consistently get you points. And at this point in time, it's clearly um, the case that he doesn't seem to be a set and forget option and, and seems to be a trap. With Christensen, I have to say that I think he's just been rotated a bit too much for the Premier League. Um, probably Thiago Silva slightly higher in the pecking order. And with Reese James coming back into the team, you're probably dealing with um, a Chelsea defender who's not that offensive playing in 50% of the games. You don't really want that in your team. I have him in my team personally, and I'm looking forward to likely move him on uh, before I move away from someone like Cody, who's a bit more nailed in my team and obviously has, um, you know, holds less money in my squad. So I think that's a, a clear issue with the, with uh, Christensen. Um, you could go for Shalaba, for example, who's who's um, a very crazy differential. He's already hauled twice in the games that he's played in so far, but I don't think it makes too much sense. You know, you either kind of move towards a fullback who's a bit more aggressive, someone like Cancelo, or you try to move into someone who's a little bit cheaper, right? And, and play a more consolidated, nailed option in your team and kind of move on from there, even though it's really sad that you won't be able to get that kind of 5.0 price Chelsea defender. Uh, but that's pretty much how I have to see things. In terms of the 5.4 to 5.7 range, I don't think there's any movement other than the fact that Chilwell has been introduced. And of course, that, that really hurts Alonso, right? Conversely, who hit a fantastic price rise into 6.0, probably one of the first times I think we've seen a defender get transferred in by more than 400,000 users. So that was very, very significant. But um, all those users were bitten by the fact that Chilwell had a very, very good game. Um, versus Southampton and of course that's going to hurt Alonso just in general because we know that now Chilwa has the capacity to start games and has the faith of Tuchel to actually play those games especially now that even if let's say Alonso is first choice he'll be have to he'll he'll be playing the Champions League whereas Chilwa could be a great option especially in the easier fixtures that Chelsea have ahead to play in those kind of Premier League games. In terms of Cresswell and Pereira I really would just lump the two in the same camp I, I think they're they provide a lot of chances for their team as well. It's very similar to Sufal, but it's just the fact that both their teams have been very poor in terms of keeping clean sheets. And ultimately, when the when the chances of keeping clean sheets are so low, you've been conceding so many goals on a game game to game basis. I don't think there's much capacity to say it makes a lot of sense to go for these players, especially when they're so so close to some of the counterparts that are actually in that six plus range, or even just someone like Rudiger who's nailed in place for Chelsea, or even Reese James who is basically a little bit more rotation prone, but has much more consistent returns in terms of his ability to haul when he's actually on the field. And that's really how uh, what I have to say about them, that they clearly fall. Uh, in the six plus range, I think we've actually seen a lot, a lot of movement, right? I think Apeliqueta was that kind of huge punt that a lot of people went for. Uh, that To be honest, I have to say that I I, I admit that I missed um, in reality. I didn't, I didn't think or expect him to get you know, to assist uh, versus Southampton, but he had a fantastic game week and... Yeah, ultimately, he probably is the third most interesting Chelsea asset, right? After Rudiger and arguably maybe even Reese James now, who's probably up in priority due to the fact that he has a time to rest. And there's not as much competition, in my opinion, in that kind of right wing back spot, um, unless there's a very, very easy game and Hudson Odoi can play. Because I think, um, well, actually, maybe maybe I'm wrong about that. Maybe maybe, maybe there's, a, there's a scenario where we could even argue that, let's say, Reese James is a differential because Apiliqueta has shown to be very capable in terms of his crossing. And that's exactly why Apiliqueta has moved up there. So it's a little bit of a tricky situation, but I think um, I'm a little bit more interested in having Apiliqueta because he can move into the centre-back position, right? So that clearly makes him a good choice for me as opposed to someone like Alonso, who conversely has fallen. Because Alonso, unless Chilwell is not starting, clearly can't get to play. Whereas Apiliqueta could still, uh, for example, play in a structure where Reese James is playing alongside him. So that's really the main difference between the two. And arguably, I think Reese James probably has benefits from that too, right? Because if Apelia Quetta can be shifted as a right centre back, then Reese James has a little bit more of a handle hold over that position because Hudson Odoi isn't as big competition as Chilwell is to Alonso, or Alonso is to Chilwell. And I think that's how I have to kind of look at that on a, on a reasonable and logical basis. Um, if we actually move into the midfielders, where I think there's actually been significant movement, um, you'll be able to see actually that uh, I've kind of rearranged the midfield category where, you know, at 5.4 to 5.8, we have someone like Mbemo, who's clearly hit a rise. And a lot of people will be probably questioning why I haven't pushed up Ducori and Townsend. Maybe Ducori actually deserves to be slightly uh, above Gray um, in a category of his own. But, but I think um, the, the nice thing about Mbemo, right, is, is the fact that he is clearly nailed in this structure for Brentford. He's not going to be nailed to play 90 minutes um, consistently, but I think he's he's clearly nailed to play 75, 80 minutes a game. And and Brentford in easier fixtures, right, which is basically that swing game week nine onwards, 
are going to be a fantastic side and having someone who's their striker and once again i have to mention he's basically an out of position player is fantastic for this point period and, and the fact that he's this cheap also makes him super tempting the issue with everton i think is that they will also be hampered by let's say dcl and richarlison coming back i can't imagine a world where ducore green and townsend are going to be hauling that consistently but i have to also admit that i think ducore's performance over the course of the season and his kind of, kind of more free attacking role in in benitez's structure even even though he's actually gotten a lot of ball recoveries, for example, this season, um, has shown that he deserves to remain in this list as a good choice. Um, there might even be capacity for Ducori to be pushed up. It really has, to, it really kind of um, goes back to maybe me having a look at whether you know, Richarlison and Diesel will be incorporated back into the side and how that affects some of the other players and their roles in the team. Because uh, especially for me, when I was watching Townsend, when Diesel was playing, I think he played a much more supportive role for the team. Whereas when Diesel has been out, he's been playing a much more aggressive attacking role. So that's kind of the trade-off there. And I still think they're good choices, but nothing more, nothing less. In terms of Gray, that's exactly why he's been rated uh, as a fall, because I think we've seen a, a lot of impact being spread across the team in terms of Ducor and Townsend. And that ultimately means that sometimes, especially with in Everton in some tougher fixtures, which are going to be coming ahead, um, his chances at hauling are probably going to be slightly less. So I think I have to say that he's probably going to drop, even though, for example, you can see that he's quite a pitiful, p uh, pivotal player, sorry, when you, for example, look at the counterattack where Townsend scored, he was the one who's actually holding the ball up, actually creating that kind of chance and, and creating the separation from the defender, waiting for Ducori to make a great run and actually laying the ball off at the perfect time. So even though I, I really do like Gray as a player, I think the time for him to be you know, a top tier FPL asset at his price range now is, is probably um, gone. Um, I'm not saying that he's not going to be a great option. I just think he's not the best option right now. When you can clearly go for Gallagher, who has improving fixtures, or someone like Mbamo, um, who is super interesting because of the position that he plays in the team. Uh, in terms of the 5.9 to 6.4 range, I think there is clear capacity to say that these players are not so interesting. Uh, I think the only player of interest has been Bowen so far, but that also kind of hampers uh, Ben Rama. I think the, the issue that we've been dealing with with West Ham is, you know, when they're scoring goals, is fantastic for someone like Ben Rama, right? Because he'll probably be involved in one or two. In the more low-scoring games and the tougher fixtures, which are going to be coming ahead for West Ham because they have fixtures like Everton and Man City coming up very shortly, those are going to be tougher games for, you know, Ben Rama to haul. And I think the, the kind of decorated top spot that he's had in this kind of range is slowly starting to move away and for that reason i think i have to drop him even though he still looks very very exciting in the games and is still creating a lot of great shot scoring opportunities right for himself uh and and also some others so that's pretty much how i see things in terms of sar i think he also has to take a drop because he's about to hit this liverpool fixture where it's going to be a little bit of a swing now there is a bit of a trade-off there where you have to say that we haven't seen for example watford play under claudio ranieri who's actually their new manager so there might be capacity, for example, to not move away from Sar this week and maybe reconsider it, especially if, let's say, in this game week, Rafinha is not going to play. So there's definitely capacity to look at Sar and, and, and maybe hold the wait and see approach to see if, let's say, Ranieri has maybe um, found a way for Watford to build a little bit more attacks because right now they're just simply not building it enough. They don't have enough control of the games, enough control of the ball to actually be to actually make Sar, even though he's a talisman for the team. Um, to be an interesting asset, even though he has a very, very nice price. And that's how I see things right now. With Bowen, I think he clearly has hit a rise just due to the fact that he's just been more consistent lately with his goal scoring. I think early on in the season, we probably argue that he was a little bit less clinical, but he's kind of found that form, uh, whether it's deflected goals or, or not. I think his confidence has clearly improved and he's taking more shots on target. And that makes Bowen an interesting option. Conversely, of course, for analysis, maybe dropped off a little bit. I think it comes down to the fact that I think Moyes has preferred Ben Rama in this kind of 10 spot in the team. And that probably also affects the pr production of Fornals, who's a little bit more of a workhorse uh, compared to the other two. But that's pretty much how I see things right now. Um, there's another kind of fall in the midfield category. And once again, I think it, it, it shows the signs of whether or, or, or where, where things are going in terms of a lot of people moving straight into these enablers, such as Gallagher and Mbomo, and then only looking at consistent options at the kind of eight plus price. So I think for that reason, someone like Greenwood and Pogba, who are about to hit some tougher fixtures, are not that interesting. I think Pogba has found it hard to be that effective in games. And, and we said that you know early on in the season. It didn't really make too much sense to have Pogba in your team um, perhaps actually early in the season, it was a fantastic kind of punt. Um, but those kind of assists weren't that consistent, right? It, it was not that he was, you know, killing teams um, with these kind of behind the back passes. It was more like situations where he would assist as someone who would crack a fantastic shot, 
uh, Bruno with a long shot, for example, would be a good example of that. Greenwood uh, actually, for me, has has had his best game so far um, whilst Ronaldo has been in the team versus Aston Villa. But then the game versus Everton was once again not interesting at all if you're a Greenwood owner. And clearly that's why he's dropped in price. And I think I, I clearly have to drop Greenwood due to the fact that fixtures are getting worse. And we know Rashford's coming back. We also know Sancho probably is going to have a slightly more opportunity to actually showcase his talents. And that just means that both options are not that interesting, um, especially since Man United just hasn't been playing that well. Jota as well has to take a fall. I think this is impacted by the fact that Firmino has not been selected for Brazilian national duty. This gives time for Firmino to actually recover, maybe pick up some form. I'm not sure whether or not like Jota will be starting versus Watford. He's clearly started uh, some of the games so far. Maybe Klopp's priorities might lie in the UCL. It depends on how he plans on using Firmino. But Jota has still been in good form in my opinion. But we saw, for example, in the kind of uh, game versus Man City where you know Klopp still sees Jota as someone who can be um, interchangeable with Firmino right or at least to just give a little bit of a different balance in the team and and clearly he's ready to make that transfer or, or that kind of benching um, when that's possible so I think this is one of those weeks where you have to say the momentum clearly is moving away from Jota as a good asset even though the underlying stats are fantastic it's probably um, time to move away from him you could maybe give him the Watford game and then actually reconsider um, but I think the, the time for Jota to be a fantastic asset in that kind of price range is probably gone, especially when it makes a little bit more sense just to stretch your money a bit further. And that's why I'm going to be looking at these kind of 7.9 plus players. This is a category where Sun clearly thrives. Sun is obviously a little bit more pricey than players like Foden and Grealish, but I think there's a clear reason for that. And we've seen that in the weeks where even though Tottenham has been playing terrible, Sun has been fantastic. He was pivotal, for example, in the Aston Villa game where he got two assists, one a little bit of an FPL assist, of course, but He's a clear talisman for the team, and I think with Kane probably dropping off in terms of production, we've actually seen Sun really pick it up and continue in that kind of stride that he built last year. And I think he clear has he clearly has plans in staying in Tottenham. He's probably the player who's slightly more motivated to turn out performances on a week-to-week -week basis, and at his price point, he's a fantastic player. So Sun makes a lot, a lot of sense. We know he's a very clinical player as well, and I think Nuno will try to build the team around him because... That's what we've seen so far, right? We've seen him play Sun at center forward at times, even even kind of putting Kane on the left. And it's clear that he sees Sun as basically this anchor for the team to kind of create and build around. Uh, in terms of Foden, I have to give him a great rise. I think the, the, the game versus Liverpool and the fact that he's had consistent starts versus Chelsea and Liverpool means that he's actually moved into the forefront of Pep's mind as that starter. And he's basically replaced the position that Torres used to occupy in the team. You know, as someone who can... Um, be a consistent starting option. He's not playing as a center forward, of course. Um, he's actually playing a little bit more left wing. And we saw Grealish kind of operating a false nine role where I think he was a little, little bit anonymous um, on the game versus Liverpool. And, and there's maybe capacity, for example, for Sterling to come in. And that's the fear, right? Um, you know, moving away from Torres that, you know, Torres looked fantastic as an FPL asset. And in a short space of time, um, you know, people like Grealish and Foden and Sterling have kind of taken the positions that you would have expected him to kind of occupy on the pitch. And Foden for now seems to be the flair for the month, but we don't know how long that's going to last. Um, and that's why I'm going to keep him as this kind of good choice because the fixtures are so nice. You know, he could really completely uh, capitulate uh, Burnley alongside, you know, his teammates. And, and that's probably why I'm so interested in him. Grealish for me has fallen. Um, I think he's actually nailed more than Foden, to be quite honest. But I think the worry is just that the production isn't there and Foden seems to be much more direct in attacking which you probably need as an FPL asset so far. Maybe it's it will still take some time before we go into Grealish later on the season, but I think the production just isn't there right now for me to really justify going for Grealish when I think you can really make an argument and say that you have to, you should be stretching your cash and you have the capacity to stretch your cash so you can go for someone like Sun. And that's pretty much how I see things right now with Grealish. In terms of Havertz, I think you have to fall again. I think Tuchel has been quite honest. I think that's one thing that we really appreciate from a manager that he... He hasn't really rated the form of, of Havertz so far, and that's exactly why Havertz has not played as many games as we expected. And it's clear that at, at his price point, he's just not worth it, um, you know, as, as an FPL asset right now. In the 11.9 range, I have to say that Mane deserves a rise. I think we've seen that he is probably going to be leading the league in XG very closely um, due to the fact that I think Salah is, is providing a lot more chances this season and, and this Liverpool team of course is building just generally more chances they lead the league in terms of expected goals and there could be a very good argument to say let's say post the Man United game to actually go for 
a, a double up of the Liverpool players, especially after that kind of Lukaku versus Norwich game, right? And that's for me the interesting part of the the dilemma. I think this season we've moved away from a two premium structure in terms of double midfielders for of Salah and Bruno being those kind of set and forget options to considering someone like Lukaku and Ronaldo. Um, I think there there's definitely things on the cards where we can say that we can move back into Mane and KDB, and there could be capacity to do that. So I think that's the kind of um, concern, not really concern, but rather kind of um, consideration that we have to make as as the game weeks go by, and maybe when Lukaku is a little bit less interesting as an option, whether we turn into someone like Ronaldo again when the fixtures are good, or whether we go into someone like Mane, uh, who I think has been much more consistent this season than the previous one. In terms of the forwards, I think we've actually seen a little bit of movement here just due to the fact that Huang has had his second consecutive start uh, for Wolves and, and he's been replacing Atrore in this kind of left inside forward role. Um, the, he doesn't necessarily play as a striker, but I think we, we do see him playing as a deep lying player and he runs you know, in between the lines a little bit less so than Jimenez, right? Jimenez is someone who, as we mentioned in previous kind of episodes, drops a little bit deeper for the team and creates. And obviously Jimenez got two assists, but I think ultimately the chances for Huang were actually very, very tough and he he showed very, very elite finishing, you know, within the limited amount of time he's been on the pitch. And I think at his price point, you know, it makes a lot of sense to probably consider Huang in our teams uh, and say that maybe that's a good way of actually covering off Jimenez without spending too much money um, on the forward line. But that's pretty much how I see Huang right now. A very consistent, solid option that you can probably look to bring in as an enabler in your team and someone who could try to cover Jimenez, right? Or at least 55 million worth of Jimenez or 5.6 rather, I think due to this price rise. Um, in terms of Jimenez, I have to give him a price rise. I don't think Wolves are necessarily building so many consistent attacks, um, but I think he's clearly found a little bit more confidence in, in the recent game weeks and he's been attacking a little bit better uh, than we'd expected. I, I still think he's slightly overperforming. I think Huang um, capitalized on some fantastic chances in the previous week and I, I would say Jimenez has you know, in terms of uh, being a goal scoring option, hasn't been that interesting this season. But I have found the, the utility of basically a lot of these strikers in the league, such as Tony, such as Jimenez, dropping back and actually creating a lot of chances for his teammates. And those assists really come in hot because when you look at someone like, say, Maxman, who's only scored one goal this season, but has actually created a lot of assists and gotten bonus points from them, I think there's capacity to say that some of the forwards are as talismanic, you know, in that sense, where they can actually be also creating a lot of plays. And that's exactly why we saw Huang scoring and, and Jimenez finding two assists that he basically deserved. And I think I have to rise him on this basis. Watkins is someone we actually mentioned as an outside shout previously, but due to the fact that he came, you know, or had an injury at the start of the season and the fact that Ings is also on the team made him a little bit hard to kind of um, justify picking. Now that he's actually started scoring and I think Aston Villa are, are, are soon to be, be hitting a fixture turn, um, I think it makes a lot of sense to consider Watkins as a differential. And I would put Hinacho in the same camp as well. Hinacho has had much less game time, I think, uh, due to the fact that I think Brendan Rodgers probably preferred a kind of one striker system. Uh, but we, we've seen Leicester struggle, and I think they, they've brought Hinacho on as a starter. Uh, but we, we still have to kind of see whether or not he remains in the structure, right, as a starter. And that's maybe the only concern with him right now. Because last season, when he was actually consistently playing, and we actually look at his kind of per 90 or maybe per minute numbers, they're fantastic as a player. So I, I'd only keep him as a differential right now, just due to the fact that I'm not 100% certain whether Brendan Rodgers is going to be looking at him as a consistent starting option. Um, there's not too much movement in terms of the elite strikers. I have to kind of fall... Um, Aubameyang, I think just due to the fact that at his price point, you're so close to Vardy, who's basically shown that he's an elite option, even in the tougher fixtures. And I think Arsenal just aren't building too many chances right now. Uh, that was something I mentioned before the Tottenham game. And I think the Tottenham game was one of those kind of key moments where Arsenal players are able to kind of blitz a Tottenham team that I think were very ill prepared, you know, on a tactical level. And we've seen for many games this season, even, even the Burnley game, um, that not too many chances are being built for Arsenal, and I think you can't justify Aubameyang being an option, whereas Vardy is still getting a lot of chances, and I'd arguably say he's also a little bit more clinical than Aubameyang, that's pretty much how it cu cuts. With Ronaldo, I think, uh, unfortunately, you have to say that he falls. Um, he's clearly at this kind of 12.6 price range where he's he's hit a price drop due to blanking the last two fixtures. We've also seen Ole, you know, tempted to rest him as well, and that's not a good sign as Ronaldo owner. You can probably look to hold him for one more week where he gets to play Leicester, and Lukaku has an arguably tougher match versus Brentford uh, than, than we probably anticipated at the start of the season. 
Um, but I think this is probably the last week of Ronaldo being an interesting option for a while due to the fact that Lukaku has this fantastic swing versus Norwich in game week nine. And, you know, we've also seen his capacity to blank in what we consider to be relatively nicer fixtures, whether that's due to the fact that he's rotated or due to the fact that Man United are just play not playing very well right now. And that's pretty much how the cookie crumbles. Uh, in terms of the goalkeepers, I'd actually say that there's not much movement here once again. I think I just had to be a little bit more reasonable with saying that I think Ramsdale clearly is the most interesting option in the game. Um, I don't think Arsenal are actually better than Brighton, but I think um, there's capacity to say that uh, Arsenal will be able to keep clean sheets just due to the fact that the defense is very, very solid. And that's what we saw in the Brighton match where despite the fact that they were overwhelmed with headers and probably Brighton should have scored one or two goals, um, I think Ramsdale for the remainder of the season becomes a fantastic option because he's gotten consistent starts from Arteta and we probably expect them to haul maybe, you know, a clean sheet or two more than Brighton. And I think what, what's the benefit with Ramsdale as well is his ability to get bonus points. We've already seen so far in the season that he's gotten more bonus points than Sanchez. And that actually maybe shows, you know, from an underlying stats basis, you probably don't want your, t your keeper to be that elite, right? In terms of reducing chances, you want the keeper to be suffering from a few shots, getting those extra bonus points and saves uh, and kind of those save points, right? So that's kind of why I think Ramsdale is at the top. Uh, Raya, I think, falls just due to the fact that, I, as I argued before, I think um, it, it still took a little bit more time for us to consider whether or not Bright, uh, Brentford are a great option. I still think he's up there as a good choice, and that's why he's right next to Sanchez, in my opinion. Um, but I think it's clear to say that I think if Ramsdale is the best option, that I think you have to kind of look at the options and, and consider whether or not they're as reasonable as, as him. And I think the, the situation and the fact is, is that he's not. Um, so I think Ramsdale is the most interesting kind of option. And for that reason, Raya has to fall. In terms of Guaita, I would say that Crystal Palace have looked very solid in their defense at times, but I think we've seen momentary lapses. And I think um, clearly they've been able to um, suffer quite a bit, I think, in recent games versus some of their uh, opponents. And, and that Leicester game was a good example of them being able to be blitzed early on in the game um, by a kind of a rather strong attack, right? This was kind of a slightly new Leicester attack where we, we saw once again the reversion back into this double striker formation. I think Crystal Palace clearly struggled. Um, we've seen them concede heavily in some games previously, and that's the, the, the slight worry, right? I think if they were able to kind of keep games um, low scoring, then I think Guaita would be quite a, quite an interesting option. But I think you don't take your chances there too much. And you probably say that it makes a little bit more sense to go with someone like Rams at this price range. And I think for that reason, uh, Guaita has to drop to a differential. Um, uh, quite a few people would also maybe mention, let's say someone like McCarthy um, as an interesting option. And I think the, the worry about McCarthy for me is just the fact that I don't think the Southampton defense is good. I think on a man-to-man -man basis, they're clearly weaker in defense than any of the teams that I've mentioned um, in that kind of 4.5 to 4.6 range with the keeper who's actually reasonable to pick. And for that reason, I think even though the fixtures are nice, you don't want to be rotating keepers and you don't really want to get out of your keeper after the Southampton sw swing gets for the worst, right? And, and so for that reason, I think McCarthy is also differential and just not that interesting. Um, nothing else has been moved on, on this list. As I mentioned, due to the fact that this is going to be a very pivotal game week where we're looking at international fixtures and considering, um, you know, what, what the kind of ramifications are of, you know, some of the international fixtures and, and maybe some even injury concerns, you know, you have to kind of stay updated with the news and, uh, make sure that you check the link in the description below to make sure that you actually stay up with all the latest news.